Okay, good morning. Uh, this is Pastor Rick from LJ, Georgia, and I wanted to talk to you about being zealous for Jesus. And I know that uh, being zealous in our life or passionate in our life is kind of an um, ongoing cycle of, of the spiritual journey or the spiritual life where um, difficulties come, life happens, uh, we're distracted, uh, the flesh is weak, whatever. It, before we know it, we're sort of lackluster, a little complacent in our zeal for the Lord. Maybe we get our ticket punched to heaven. We know we're saved. We know that without a shadow of a doubt. <clears throat> but then we just begin to kind of go through life, think, well, you know, it's a little easier uh, to go along and um, get along. And so sometimes life just has a way of taking the zeal for the Lord out of us. And so I want to take your attention to Revelation 3 and verse number 19, where it says, as many as I love, this is the Lord speaking, I rebuke. That word rebuke means to tell a fact or, or fault. Um, it means to convict or reprove or admonish. And so the Lord says, if I love you, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you where your faults are. And chasten, which means to teach or to discipline, to educate. Really, the idea is to train up a child. And so when he talks about chastening, he says, if I love you, I'm going to tell you where you're wrong, and I'm going to teach you what's the right way to go. And so what I need from you is for you to be zealous then to repent, which means to consider what you've been, as I tell you, what I'm calling you to, and make the decision to go the right way, to repent of this way and go God's way uh, and not your own way. Now, as we look at Revelation 3 and verse number 19, we recognize that it is in the context of Revelation uh, discussion of the seven churches. We're talking about the church of Laodicea, a church that had become comfortable and complacent and sort of self-satisfied, unaware of its own spiritual condition. Matter of fact, didn't see itself as having any need, thought she was rich and clothed uh, sumptuously and all of that prosperous. And yet she was naked. She was vulnerable. Uh, to the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so the Lord kind of calls her on that. Now, we know that the church of Laodicea was in a place where there were some warm mineral waters nearby, which were not good to the taste. If you've lived on a farm and ever got a good taste of sulfur water, you'll recognize what I'm talking about, or it'll paint a vivid, vivid uh, picture in your mind. And so they had water like that. So they would have been aware, well, well aware of the idea of water not tasting good and being lukewarm and spitting it out and it just not being refreshing. And the church had become that way in Laodicea. And so the Lord deals with her by showing her her needs, stirring her heart concerning her lack of passion and zeal for himself. And he says, look, I'm going to show you these things so that you can be zealous or eager, passionate about changing your direction and going my way. And so what was their need, really? Their need was more Jesus, which we're going to see. And I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of this. You can read um, uh, Revelation chapter 3 and uh, this whole story from, you know, the beginning to the end in verse 14 down to verse number 22. I'm just going to kind of give you the general topics as I see them. So basically, the overall was condition was they had drifted from the Lord in their heart. They'd become dispassionate. They were going through the motions. They didn't see their need because they'd become prosperous in, in the things of this world. And the reality is you can be rich in this world and poor towards God, or you can be rich towards God. And the things of this world, they grow strangely dim, whether you're prosperous or not. It doesn't affect you. It, it's what God wants for you in your life. And so what we need when we find ourselves in this condition is we need more Jesus. So we see their condition in verse number 17. I just described it to you. I encourage you to read it because it speaks specifically in very, um, I think, uh, eloquent terms of, of their conditioning, our condition, but basically summed up by saying, Basically, you say, we don't need anything. We're wealthy. We're good. We're clothed. We're, we're all right. And so the advice is found in verse number 18, where he counsels them that instead of being worried about their external physical uh, wealth and prosperity, to turn inwardly and buy things that only 
God can give, you know, the divine uh, working of God in our hearts, the gold and all of that, and clothed in the righteousness of Christ, which is the white robes. And so that was his advice. Then we see the call that I mentioned in verse number 19. And the solution is found in verse number 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice, open the door, I will come in with him and I will sup with him and he with me. And so what you need when you lack spiritual passion and zeal uh, in ministry, in your church, in your personal life, you need to return to your first love. You need to get back to Jesus. He's standing, knocking at the door of the heart of the believer, asking to come in, asking to fellowship with you. And he is life. He is life, right? And, and it's from him that we draw vitality and spiritual life and zeal. So if we're going to be zealous for God, then it comes through a personal communion with Jesus Christ. And that's the solution. And then the promise he gives us in verse 21 is that we will overcome the world and we will reign victoriously with him. Of course, our mind goes to 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, that talks about who's he that overcome the world, but he but a person of faith. And a person of faith is not just faith in anything, but it's faith in Jesus, 1 John 5 and verse number 5. And so the reality is, um, as it relates to ministry, God does give us what we need to carry out the work of the ministry, but we're never to rest in it, to be comfortable in our resources and our wealth. Proverbs um, chapter 21 and verse number 31 says this, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is in the Lord. That's where we find our safety and security. That's where we find our life and our vitality and our strength for ministry. Now, I'm going to just read Titus to you, chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, and tell you there is no excuse for you and I not to have a zeal and a passion for Jesus, considering what he has accomplished on our behalf. Listen to what he says. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, put all that aside because that's what makes us comfortable and complacent. We should live soberly, not drunken in our prosperity or or, uh, lethargic in our prosperity, but we are to live soberly, righteously, and the only way we can do that is in the imputed righteousness of Christ and godly. In this present world, that means now, while we're living here on earth, and we're to live passionately serving the Lord in anticipation of his return. He says this in verse number 13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Why? That he might redeem us from all our iniquity and purify us unto himself a peculiar people. And what was the purpose? So that we would be zealous, not complacent, not cold, not comfortable, but zealous unto or for good works. Now, he's talking about good works that come out of a relationship with him, good works that are empowered by faith and knowing that it is the God living in us that is moving us to do and empowers us to do the things that we do. And therefore, the word good here is beautiful. It means morally upright. It's valuable. It's virtuous. It's things motivated by faith. Because Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And if we become placent and satisfied in our own sufficiency, we become like the church at Laodicea, comfortable, then before you know it, we're proud of ourselves. And Proverbs 21, verse 2 says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord ponders the heart. Verse 4, a high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. So once we become comfortable, complacent, satisfied in ourselves, become proud of ourselves, we lose our zeal. And that lack of zeal uh, actually hinders or quenches the passion that we should have for serving God in the world in which we live in. Now, as we um, close out this section, I just pray that God will stir your heart and bring you back to a place of passion where you love him with all your heart. You throw off all your self-sufficiency 
and you enter into communion with Christ and allow him to clothe you with his righteousness and then live godly for the glory of our God in anticipation of his soon return, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless you. Have a great day.